And now to talk about scientific revolutions is industrial artist, Matthew Dockery. Take it away. Hey. So in 1665, the world's oldest scientific journal, Philosophical Transactions, started publication. And for the last year, I've been working on a project where I read them, starting with issue number one. I dig up all the historical context I can for the articles, put it together, make a video about it, and post it. It's been a lot of work, but also a lot of fun, and I've learned some stuff that I thought I would share with you here. So it was a project of the Royal Society of London, one of their first big projects, actually. And their secretary, Henry Oldenburg, had long been the center of a kind of scientific pen pal network spanning Europe. And the journal was really a formalization of that. It uh, saved him the effort of handwriting out all the copies, I suppose. He mostly saw it as a way to make money on the side, but, well, unfortunately for him, that never worked very well. Uh, but it worked pretty well for everyone else. But to really understand philosophical transactions, you have to go back even further in this, earlier in the century to Francis Bacon. He was a mildly corrupt court official who was absolutely convinced that uh, academics have been doing everything wrong for centuries. If you wanted to learn about the world, you had to do experiments. You couldn't just sit around and think about it really hard. In his book, The New Organon, he very explicitly says that we need to move away from deductive reasoning and embrace inductive reasoning instead. The, uh, the old satire about angels on the head of a pin, well, he didn't write it, but it was from his time and he probably would have approved. He even wrote a story called The New Atlantis about a fictional island kingdom at the center of which is Solomon's house. Uh, which to a modern eye can only really be described as a research institute. They gather knowledge about the world, study it, and use it as the basis for further experiments. And by following this technique, the fictional kingdom has gained some really amazing technological powers, including well, what we would call televisions and submarines and recorded music. It's an oddly prophetic book in a lot of ways. But this was still a very centralized, very top-down understanding of science. Bacon thought that the project should be first to collect all the facts about the world, natural histories on fire and air and birds and everything. And once you've done that, it would probably only be the project of a couple years for people to go through and look at it all and figure out the rules and how the world works. Well, this was convincing enough that several decades later, some people were really trying to make it happen. The Royal Society grew out of a series of public lectures at Gresham College. Some public lectures not too unlike these, actually. And they were very explicitly trying to start Solomon's House. And a big part of that would be tools of communication, which is where the journal came in. Now, the first couple decades were pretty rough. They started just in time for the plague. And then they got back from that just in time for the Great Fire. And then Oldenburg was thrown into the tower under suspicion of being a Dutch spy. But it was also rough because they didn't know what they were doing. And that's really the joy out of reading the early issues, is that you get to see them inventing the very concept of scientific publication from issue to issue. Uh, the contents were also rough and kind of a mixed bag. Um, you get the earliest recorded um, record of the great red spot of Jupiter, and it's next to a description of a deformed head of a monstrous calf. There are book reviews and trip reports and a lot of descriptions of mining technology. But for me, one of the other big joys is getting to see how different the actual process of the scientific revolution was compared to the stories we tell about it today. So take astronomy as an example. There are a lot of articles about cometary motion, and many of them end with a note to the effect that maybe this will help settle the grand question of the Earth's motion. Now, remember, we are 120 years after Copernicus at this point, and 30 years after Galileo. Those kind of paradigm shifts really have a much longer tail than history books usually indicate to us. When we're learning science, it's a very sanitized version with all the dead ends removed and presenting a nice linear narrative. But real science is messy and petty and weird, and it always has been. Now, the glory of science is that it works, even despite that. But they didn't know that at the time. They really thought they were forming uh, Solomon's house and would just sort of dispassionately argue about the facts and do experiments. And instead they got confusion and infighting and a distinct lack of decorum. But they still generated the greatest engine for the de development of knowledge the world had ever seen. It wasn't what they intended, but it worked. And the communication of scientific results to the journal was a really integral part of that. By scaling up Oldenburg's 
Pinpal network, they turned it into something completely different. It had made the private public, and it let science be more than just a hobby for rich weirdos. Um, and that's at least something I'm very thankful for. So basically, the scientific method works despite who's doing it. Exactly. Um, and I, we're just kind of lucky that they let it keep going, even though it really failed to live up to so many of their ideals beforehand. Which is your uh, favorite story from back then? Oh, um, there was this amazing exchange between Robert Hooke and this French astronomer, Adrien Nizou. And Hook had just published his magnificent book, Micrographia, which is just filled with these amazing illustrations. The flea in these slides is from that. It's a pretty famous image. But as also part of the book, like he got a chance to write a book. So he was going to put in everything he could. And one of the things he shoved in there was this idea he had for how to improve lens grinding, just a whole new mechanism for doing it. But he'd never actually tried it. He just like, here's what I think would work. And Azu writes into the journal saying this really doesn't live up to our grand Baconian ideals of basing everything on personal experience and experimentation. And Hook just loses it at that uh, with some amazing vitriolic attacks and response, including an amazing argument that Azu was really the hypocrite because Azu hadn't done an experiment to prove the device wouldn't work. Um, and to me, that just really summarizes just how quickly things got pretty nasty, actually. And that's not even, of course, getting into the, the more famous disputes between uh, Newton and others later in the century. Hmm. If someone wanted to read like a book on this topic, what would you recommend? Oh, that is a very good question. Um, I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Um, there is one I am thinking of, uh, and it's sitting behind me somewhere. Well, we'll follow up later and share it in the show notes. I will do Thank that. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you.